Okay, folks, welcome back. I hope you all joined the session just now. Uh, it was a great conversation uh, with the folks from our Transforming Tradition uh, panel. Um, we have another exciting program coming up right away for you now. Uh, our next program is Beyond the Bench, uh, which invited artists, exhibition designers, and curators to discuss their curatorial process from conception to realization. Uh, there's three presenters and each will give a brief presentation and this session also will be followed by a Q&A session uh, led in sessions by Olivia Shi. Um, so I'm going to introduce for you our first presenter and then I will play their presentation. Uh, so our first presenter for today is Wan Hee Sho, who is a contemporary art jewelry artist from South Korea. They received their BFA from Rochester Institute of Technology in 2010. She then studied at Rhode Island School of Design graduate program for their postgraduate study, and from 2012 to 2014, taught jewelry and metal class continuously investigating creation and innovation of her own work as a resident artist at Sono in South Korea. During this time, she's participated in many exhibitions and competitions that are highly respected and recognized, such as Niche in Kogenta, Itami International Craft Exhibition, Preziosa Young Award, the Cominelli Fandon Fondazioni, uh, and many, many others, uh, locations across Japan, Germany, Poland, Italy, the Netherlands, South Korea, and the United States, and has often been selected as a finalist or winner in those events. In 2016, she received her master's degree in jewelry and metalwork from San Diego State University, and currently she is actively engaging with various exhibition and craft shows in the United States, South Korea, as a jewelry artist. She has also been teaching at universities as a visiting pro professor in South Korea. Uh, um, first presentation for Beyond the Bench, and I'm going to play that for you now. Please enjoy. Hello, everyone. First of all, it is my great honor to have this opportunity to present my work at the SNAG Symposium. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Wan Hee Cho, an active artist working as a lecturer and a visiting professor for several universities in Korea. To briefly give you an idea of my educational background, I received BFA in jewelry design at Meracrafts of Upstate New York, Rochester Institute of Technology studied jewelry and metalsmithing, graduate studies for about a year and a half at Rhode Island School of Design, and received MA degree from San Diego State University. Today, I have completed PhD program in design and craft from Hongik University for Korea and waiting on graduation. I have been studying jewelry and metal work for about 15 years and as an artist, I have been actively holding exhibitions in various countries including Korea, the United States, Japan, Germany, Poland, England, Netherlands and Italy and at the same time working on various material studies. The piece I am about to present before you today is about human body and its movements. Specifically, it is to explain how I made a series of observations on body movements and how I tried to express my insights from those observations through uh, organized art expression. In today's plastic arts, we are witnessing some major changes or advancements, if you will, within the field, as borders among various genres are fading and being integrated together with our society's diversification. This very trend is expanding genres boundaries infinitely and through integration of digital medium and mixing various materials, the field of plastic arts is freely developing in various aspects such as physical, formative, and conceptual. It is very trend of 
dematerialization and the formless form help and allow plastic arts concepts to be developed and advanced without restriction. And the same goes for the way art pieces are expanded as well. And of course, it surely applies to the field of art jewelry all the same. As I have been studying the art of jewelry over the years, I have grown interest in human body itself, specifically on its meaning and forms. And naturally, I spent a lot of time researching how to express, what materials to use, and which techniques to apply to my work to better portray human bodies and its meanings and forms. Body is a medium as well as a subject that create artistic inspirations in various fields of contemporary arts, such as plastic arts, performance arts, as well as new media. First, I have documented body movements in video images, then visualized them through pictures, and lastly, I went through dimensionalizing process by working them on 3D program. Silicone, resin, and metal fabrications were used to create my jewelries. And by utilizing techniques like distortion, deformation, expansion, and reduction, superfusion, and repetitions, I try to stage body and its fluid form. While I have studied human body and related theories and concepts, I started to focus on studying body as a medium or agent, which embodies stories related to the body itself, based on the philosophical work by Maurice Merleau-Ponty, specifically his discussion about temporality and speciality. For the project, I tried to study body and its created movement, then document this on video and camera. Specifically, I tried to study a model's body gestures by filming their motions instead of drawing it on a sketchbook. In addition, a series of body motions were peeled up in layers to visualize various gestures just like they do in long exposed photography. With this technique, I could formalize forms or messages created by body movements. Maybe this short video I have prepared will help you understand what I just said. The video is about two minutes long.
We naturally use body gestures to supplement our spoken languages when we face difficulty in communication and people's personality and tendency may be expressed in body gestures in forms of habits. Take shaman for instance, if you have seen shaman's performancing rituals, it seems like they are expressed their unique languages or messages through various motions or movements. Also, when people offer respect or condolence to others, uh, various body gesture like this, gestures are used to deliver feelings. The two examples I just mentioned represent how people use body gestures or movements to express one's emotions and perceptions. I captured these motions in peeled up layers with time difference on film and tried to utilize different body motions to show its abstractive visual aspects. That brings us to the second video clip I prepared. In this video, a subject will move and embody various forms like she did during the first video. However, this time, screen is installed between the subject and audience, between the subject and camera, to give both visible and invisible effects of motions to study its synesthetic expressions or representation. As you could see from the video clip, various materials like Retan vinyl, PVC vinyl, glass acrylic, silicone, fabric were used in the project. The model used these materials as a cover or they were put in between the model and the camera as a screen to express and document the model's fluid motion. Think about the frame of a tent the frame allows fabric of the tent to stretch. The same things can be said here. When we the model created motions under the screen of a fabric or materials with liquidity, it allowed body and its shapes to extend and stretch, creating organic forms. Moisture or water drops were used on acrylics to make the boundaries of shapes go blur and by using pattern glasses, parts of the body were enlarged, reduced, or shown rep repeatedly to present visual debates embraced by body shape and meanings beyond expression. In this study, media outlets, digital technology, as well as mixed materials were utilized to materialize the work in physical, material, and conceptual aspects to possibly offer a new methodology of various applications. Merleau-Ponty once suggested that the world is product that is made up from mixture of those visible and invisible. In a world we live in, it is filled with things that require our senses. For example, various information can be obtained through vision and touch. However, there is a realm we cannot express with our naked eyes. It is a word that can only be seen with consciousness. Ponty explained it, this phenomenological concept through the analysis of our body. That is, according to Ponty, when we come to learn a new notion 
We simply have to experience it with our body and gain information from that very experience to know what it is. For instance, take the concept of hot. Before we learn what hot means and what trigger the sense related to it, we simply have to experience it to know what it actually is. In other words, the very first experience with uh, anything new for the very first time, it is simply an experience we go through with our body. It is the encounter between our body and the world. Not an injection of some concept or idea or learning. My study is on these unconscious forms expressed in motions as habits. These motions are not intentional nor have planned thoughts behind them. By covering a body with a silicon screen or staging a visual effect by locking up a body inside transparent resin, I tried to build up body movements in certain time window as one big record. As if connecting all the dots, connecting all the movements as one like they do in long exposed photography. I tried to create an abstractive form or figure. All these things I did were to show aesthetic aspect of our body movement that is different from expressing motions in directive ways. As you can see from the image, the model's limited motions on a turntable were repeatedly connected to express the continuity of time. I tried this same technique to create a brooch by putting together layers of human shapes created from various motions. I could drive various abstractive products of body forms using overlapping technique as well as continuity of time. In this study, I used various media mediums like photography and filming and instead of carving or casting sculptures, I utilized the digital technology like 3D program to create and express forms. And lastly, through various material studies, mixed materials were used to suggest a number of visual methodologies. In addition, the work from my invisible series from the video were created in hopes to possible give a new light on the meaning of a human body and its relationship. By utilizing new technologies such as 3D printing and image processing techniques, I hope that Invisible will go beyond from just showing artistic expression of a human body, but it will actually expand in various aspects that one, it can give aesthetical value to formative expression by applying, modifying body forms, and two, it will give new conceptual and artistic meanings or insights. That is all I prepared for today's presentation. Thank you for your time. Wow, um, that was so amazing. I would love to have her direct everything that I do from now on. <laughs>
on um, just that intersection of materiality and that line throughout the work, this exploration and experimentation, even in the filmic space, not just in kind of the physical um, object space is truly fascinating. And I'm very excited uh, to delve more into her work um, beyond this. But for now, I'm going to introduce our next presentation, which is Mei Ye Young. Uh, who is a jewelry designer born and raised in Shenzhen, China. She completed her MFA at the Rochester Institute of Technology, majoring in metal and jewelry design. Mei Yi is dedicated to pursuing her passions in life. She draws inspiration from the minor details that are often missed when living life too fast. I hear you. <laughs> she has a deep interest in fashion and garment design. This allows her to go beyond the traditional metalsmith mindset. Fashion allows her to explore new creative boundaries and implement new ideas and concepts within her work. She firmly believes that the mind and body are creative platforms that enable expression and growth. Jewelry design serves as a catalyst to convey her ideologies and development. I'm now going to play uh, her video for you, so enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Mei Yi. Thank you so much for having me at um, Beyond the Bench. I am more than happy to be here, sharing my very interesting and amazing experience about how to host a jewelry exhibition. This is a lot to talk about. Mm, there are always some common stereotypes and misconceptions of Chinese culture when people are talking about Chinese jewelry. Only very few things was acknowledged. There is always jade, beads, everything dragon, but we're definitely more than that. I was born in 1991, Generation Y or Z, I guess it's Generation Y. Um, I think we are a very special uh, generation. We went through the entire period of technological evolution and the rise and develop of media. We were not born into it. We migrated to the digital world from the analog one in which we were living. So a lot of artists, when they were creating some artwork, they adopted heritage and cultures because different cultures affects the way we think. Um, we know how to embrace and play with it. Um, there is a Chinese jewelry artist who is in London now. She is using Dian Cui, which is a lost Chinese jewelry craft ship, um, but using turkey firm and recycled materials instead of Kingsburg. That's a very cool combination. Um, in between transition and modern. So everyone got more or less from our roots, our um, heritage, using a contemporary way or modern way to redefine, um, recreate jewelry, to recreate art. Um, so this is what I want to present. Um, and this is the reason why I want to do that. I want to see um, how it will look like when people using a modern way to express the tradition um, culture or use the tradition way to do the, the modern things. That's going to be very fun. Um, so let's talk about how I got prepared. So my mom told me, you don't marry anyone on a whim. It's saying applies to anything, I mean, including making an exhibition. It's all on a whim and making a sudden decision. I was never a jeweler curator, but very dying to do it without thinking too much. Um, so, which was a very unsmart move. I don't have a venue before I send out the open call. So, that's very unsmart. So, make sure you have. Um, a venue or make sure you already reserve a gallery or showroom for the exhibition first before you start it. So it took me a very long time to hunt a proper venue in Manhattan. Make sure you have to 
reserve a gallery first. Um, so I send out the open call out. Um, you gotta make sure that contact everyone who is involved in this business, um, people who run the social media, um, journalist, influencer, all the art and jewelry platform. Don't be shy to um, express because when you talk to people, this is the only way to let information out and find teammates or helpers or people who are volunteer to help you. This is how I met my friend Yuji. So she works for Clem02 and running her, um, her own jewelry in what I'm doing and agree with my concepts. So she helped me to post an open call at her platform and told me that I should do with all the professional, what I should do with all the professional social media things. Um, through her help, my exhibition got tons of um, exposure. Let's go back to how I found a venue for the exhibition because I was very lucky. Thanks to um, the two co-founders from New York City Jewelry Week, JB and Bella, they got me a room at 2019 Jewelry Week in headquarters. Um, I am very grateful for that. When you have a limited budget, a high traffic um, area, it's above everything. So that place is always crowded and packed. So I think for my show, it's a really good place and a very good option. Um, you have to make sure that you're going to be visible first because you have to be out there. So this venue is located in Canal Street, which is um, always crowded and very close to the train station. So I am very satisfied with that. <clears throat> and then you need to... Um, build a team. So first of all, when you have a limited budget or maybe it's like zero budget to hire people, find someone who also interested in what you are doing now. Make sure everyone are able to complement one another. So I found Richie and Debbie. They were both in jewelry major. Richie has a very strong um, execution skill and good eye. Um, Debbie is my PR manager, so she writes the best press release. She is very calm, so she calms me down every time when I was freaked out. Mm, so after we got the venue, I want to I went to check it out, and I found out that it needed to be ren uh, renovated. So lighting is a very important part. So if you are not having a show in the professional gallery, make sure you add the lights. Um, it can be all done by yourself. It's easy. I watch YouTube. YouTube is my teacher. He taught me how to install um, tracking light. So all you need to do is just um, figure out what type of tracking light you need and just go to Home Depot or hardware store to get everything you need and come back and you, you can just all install everything by yourself. So that was my experience. Um, I was also host a panel discussion during the exhibition, which is the funniest part. I personally love to host the event. The would be funnier. It's like frosting on the cake, making the whole things memorizable. My college professor, Leonard Erso, told me that I should always bond with my community because they're powerful and always can back you up. So it triggers me to contact um, China Institute. They are a very big um, Chinese cultural organization. Again, I am very, very lucky. So China Institute offered help. Um, they offer me the whole floor for the panel discussion. So the capacity goes up to, um, I remember it was 80 people. Because it's a very good option to, uh, it's a very good opportunity to spread new Chinese uh, jewelry art. I would definitely not waste any chance of that. So I also arrange a little showcase and networking before the panel gets started. 
it was for the artist who wasn't um, in the exhibition and some art school student. They're able to networking with everyone and presenting their art pieces and concepts. Speak of bands with my community. I got a lot of sponsor from my Chinese community. Um, I am very thankful. I asked Junzi Kitchen for help, see if they can cover the food and drinks on the opening day and panel day. Um, remember, food and drinks always brings joy to people and gathering people together. So don't forget about it when you going to throw our show and make sure you get food, you get desserts. Um, and all the prints, uh, like all the brochures, all the posters, all the postcards, they're um, from cloud printing. They offer me tons of high quality prints. They are fast, very responsible. Prints are important. You have to have enough um, quality to support you to the end of the show. So make sure you got enough um, prints and good quality prints. And also um, the flower vendor branches in blooms offer free flowers to all the audience as a gift. And R&B exotic car rental, they are the operator for the event. And my jewelry community as well. Brooklyn Metal Works and New York City Jewelry Week, they helped me to spread um, my open call and spread all the updated information about my show. When I ask help, uh, ask, when I ask for help, mm, they say yes without any hesitation, and didn't ask to pay back. So that moment, I just I feel the power of community. I couldn't have done it without it. Let's talk about a panel discussion. So I invited five panelists with us. They are from different background. So there's jewelry designer, accessory designer, educator, and investment people who are um, doing investment banking. Mm, it helps people look at jewelry from different perspective. So you're going to talk to the panelists and discuss with them before the um, discussion. Ask if there is any question they want to answer or um, if there is anything they require to um, to talk about. So that will be very important to communicate with them before the panel gets started. And some of the people, they're very talkative. So as a host, you're going to have a timer and always watch out the time, like giving everyone chance equally to talk to. And you have to leave... Um, like a little bit time for the Q and A section because, um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people they have question to ask. Um, last but not least, I wanna talk about what I did after the show opened. So as a curator, I have to remember every art pieces, uh, every the description about every art pieces, and work with um every single artist because. I have to figure out um, what they want to present because most of them, um, they were not based in New York. So I have to present it for them um, and it will help buyer and or audience to get as much, inf as much information as they could, um, helping people to know the art pieces and create the sales. And secondly, um, you have to um, like get all the payment ready like um, using Square or Zelle or PayPal, just be ready because you don't want to miss any sale. Um, and try your best to contact the artists who were based locally and let them come to the exhibition to represent themselves. Um, I am not a professional curator, so there are a lot that I have to learn. I don't think that my um, 15 minutes sharings covers everything um, because they're um, selected. I have a lot of things I would love to talk about. So please um, Instagram DM me if you have any question. 
um, it could be about exhibition or my own artwork or um, Chinese Sorry, folks, just a little bit of sound cut out at the end there. Fortunately, we were already uh, at the very end. Sadly, missed her little sign off there, but not too much information. Um, what a great presentation and overview of everything and shout outs uh, to my other friends over at New York City Jewelry Week. Um, so we're going to uh, run the third presentation uh, for um, this sack shit. And coming up is Anya Eichler. Uh, Anya holds a PhD in business administration and worked for several years in this field. She later attended Alchemia School of Jewelry in Italy, where she graduated in 2011. She lived and worked for several years in China and wrote articles about Chinese contemporary jewelry for Art Jewelry Forum. Her work centers on bringing aspects of life into jewelry, be it through everyday materials or pointing to everyday issues. She has been exhibited internationally and nationally and gives lectures, teaches workshops and curates exhibitions around the world. Her presentation will focus on cultural reference system influences, what we see and what we do, uh, and will be broken into two parts, understanding and selecting artworks as well as organizing an exhibition. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that presentation for you now, enjoy. Hello to North America and the rest of the world. My name is Anya and I'm an artist and jewelry maker based in Berlin. I'm happy to present you today my talk, Griddle Incense S, or Lost in Translation, about living and curating in China. Let me quickly share my screen and go into full screen mode on this map. You can see that I have been uh, living abroad in a variety of countries. My last day was in Shanghai, where I spent three years. I was very lucky to come to know several Chinese jewelry makers and to have the opportunity to write about Chinese contemporary jewelry for Art Jewelry Forum. On top, I curated um, several um, art exhibitions. My talk, in my talk, I will illustrate how cultural differences influence the curatorial process in China. After a first uh, a brief introduction, I will talk about understanding and selecting artworks, organizing an exhibition, and finally, I will draw some conclusions. This is what the Pudong area in China looked when I arrived in 2011. Already back then, the city had a skyline like any other mega city in the Western Hemisphere. Moreover, quite a few people uh, spoke English. So on the surface, the di city didn't feel as foreign as I had expected. However, below the surface, as I later found out, was an entirely different universe. Edward Hall calls this phenomenon the cultural iceberg. The observable part, the things that, for example, a tourist recognizes, is much smaller than the not observable part. I think that it's mostly by living in a country that one might understand to understand some of these not observable issues. While studying the menu in a restaurant in China, I stumbled over this dish whose translation read, griddle incense as. Chinese and Western tastes uh, differ quite a bit. Nevertheless, it was clear that something here must have been lost in a machine translation. A human translation could be savory donkey dry pot style. Now we might think that this is just the result of a senseless algorithm and has nothing to do uh, with us. However, uh, during my stay in China, I uh, wondered that if we don't reflect on our proper cultural iceberg, might we also act like a senseless algorithm? Will important aspects get lost in translation? 
it is important to point out that even we ourselves often can't observe the not observable part of our own cultural iceberg. Its items are inherent in our image of the world, non-reflected values, and in our routines. So we might be prone to translating our experiences word for word according to the algorithms of our own cultural uh, and background. Now, you might wonder what this has to do with curating a jewelry exhibition. Let's look at these works by Shannon Guo, titled Mini Landscape Ring Series from 2011. What do you see when you look at these artworks? My first thought, seemingly underlined by the title of the work, was it's a depiction of nature. Of course, if you take a longer look, there's much more to see, even with a, a Western eyes. Now, imagine yourself in a museum. The average visitor spends 15 to 30 seconds in front of an artwork, if at all, since there's also something called a sweep rate, which means that people are just walking by an artwork. So if you think that you know what you see, it might be like, okay, I got that, next one. In this case, however, you would have missed on quite a bit. To go into detail would lead too far for this talk. In case you want to know more, you can retrieve the article Griddle Incense S on Art Jewelry Forum. For now, I will just give a rough outline. The first thing is that the stone is not a stone, but a sealed stone that can be taken out of its setting and being used as such. So the artist can print uh, her name with it. Secondly, the scenery points to potted mini gardens know, uh, that we know as bonsai arrangements. These bonsai arrangements point to bigger landscape gardens, and those are based on Tao's philosophy. Even this rough outline shows that there might be a lot more to appreciate in this work than we see with an untrained Western eye. To me, getting some of the background was a real eye opener. Regarding curation, I wonder whether it is necessary for a Western curator to engage with the Chinese view, which means the not observable part of the cultural iceberg, or if a work can also be appreciated without it and talk for itself. From my point of view, co-curation with somebody from China is a good answer to the question posed before, since it means teaming up with an expert. My partner in Shanghai was Shannon Guo. She's a US trained uh, jewelry maker, directs the craft department and the jewelry and metals program at the Shanghai Academy of Fine Arts. And back then was the owner of Two Cities Gallery in Shanghai. Our two exhibitions, Natural Jewelry in 2013 and Distant Relations in 2014, were based on our friendship and rooted in the spirit of bringing together jewelers' works from China and the West. Since Two Cities uh, uh, was Shannon's proper gallery, staff with trained and enthusiastic personnel under her supervision, everything went really smoothly and was a, it was a big pleasure to work together. Another project came around when a friend arranged a contact to assist organizing a jewelry exhibition in China. My task was to enlist Western artists for applying for the exhibition to be the contact person in case of questions and to act as an ambassador and tour guide for those were invited to come to China. Looking back, this pro project was like a lens that bundled several cultural differences into a focal point. One difference is what Alexander Thomas calls the task versus the relationship orientation of a culture. 
and task-oriented cultures, the primary means of achieving one's goal is to skillfully managing tasks and time. So a good or successful person is one who gets the job done efficiently. In relationship-oriented cultures, on the other hand, the group to which a person belongs is a crucial part of that person's identity and goals are accomplished, accomplished via relationships. Putting some names of countries into this spectrum, and uh, we see that among the task-oriented uh, places are Germany, the US, or Scandinavia. Others like France, Spain, Italy or others are in between, are in the in-between spectrum and truly relationship-oriented places are China, Russia, Japan and others. Three cornerstones of project organization and thus uh, organizing a jewelry exhibition are tasks, goals, trust and people. In task-oriented cultures, the most important point is to set tasks and goals and make a plan. Having done this creates uh, the trust in being capable to manage the project details. After this, you staff your project. In relationship-oriented cultures, the most important part is to establish and cultivate personal relations to create trust before starting out on a project. This given any exhibition project with an international team and international participants potentially comprises a set of different to even contrary expectations and behaviors. Another cultural difference, very vividly in, illustrated by Yang Liu in her book East Meets West, concerns hierarchies. In Eastern cultures, bosses have great authority, influence and respect. A Chinese boss typically expects employees to take orders unquestioned. The effects on the work in an exhibition team are obvious. In case that there is a boss even higher up in the hierarchy than the exhibition manager, these issues might also influence the exhibition setting itself. Because if this person decides, for example, that the date of the exhibition or the exhibition venue is to be changed, that's it. People will start reorganizing. Relating changes like this to Western people, like the participating artists, is far more difficult. Dealing with problems. Westerners tend to take the most direct approach to problem solving. Problem solving in Asia is a bit more complex and it may involve an indirect approach. At some point during the organization of the jewelry exhibition, all deadlines like the notifications of participating artists were missed for more than a month. And that was pre-corona time. There was no information to be had how the project would proceed. It just seemed dead. The Western side was worrying and complaining. The mood and the enthusiasm for the project were deteriorating rapidly. The Chinese side remained silent while being busy solving the problems. Eventually, things started moving forward again. Shortly before the opening, the invited Western artists arrived in China. The prospect of the coming days was still unclear, and some people complained about this since, for example, they had plans for, uh, for sightseeing on their own or just uh, wanted to be in the clear what would be happening. I had no information to offer, and I felt a bit helpless and embarrassed. The day after, the schedule was revealed. This anecdote illustrates another cultural difference about emotions. Westerners show their feelings far more clearly than Easterners. The norm in Asia is to hide displeasure, especially in front of superiors. 
So finally, the day of the opening had arrived and we were allowed to take a peek inside the exhibition hall before it was open to the public. The huge doors opened and the exhibition just looked great. In the following days, we ate together, we explored the city together. There was enough time for private plans and everything uh, dissolved into happiness. The Western artists returned home full of praise uh, of the event. It was a success. Lesson learned. The Chinese are very pragmatic and willing to work extremely hard if necessary. If you think it can't be done, it can be done. If it is, respectively, you are important enough. Now for the conclusions. The process of curating is deeply rooted and influenced by social and cultural structures. Curating can be a way to enter different, a different culture and to, and to reflect on one's own. And in relationship-oriented cultures like China, it is really advisable to know people personally, to build up trust before starting out on a project. Thank you for your attention and see you soon. What a great presentation. I'm particularly excited by this idea of uh, referencing our experience of culture as being algorithmic, even in terms of human behavior. I really love that. And this task relationship spectrum uh, is a new thing to me. I'm going to investigate that more. So I'm excited for all of the things that were raised during that talk. Uh, folks, we're now going to head over to sessions. And our moderator, Olivia, she is going to moderate a conversation uh, about uh, everything we just saw. And I'm going to introduce Olivia before you jump over there. Uh, Olivia is a contemporary jeweler, artist, and writer based in Oakland, California. Uh, born in the U.S. and raised in Taiwan, she is interested in the cultural nuances that can be explored through wearable sculpture. Olivia holds a BA in creative writing from Columbia University and a BFA in jewelry and metal arts from the California College of Arts. She currently works as the editorial assistant at Metalsmith Magazine and runs her eponymous jewelry business. So everyone, ready to head over to sessions. If you're not sure where to find that, check on the left-hand panel of your screen, there's a little icon where you can transition between sessions and the stage. Uh, we will see you there. And then we will be back here after the conversation for exploring education at 4.30 on the main stage. Uh, we'll see you over in sessions. Hope you enjoyed the presentations. I'm, I'm really happy uh, that uh, you invited me. Thank you I very much. The presentation okay. was so interesting. Stacey and I met, we were like texting back and forth about some, it was, it, it was, I thought it was really interesting too, where you break it out at the, um, at the end. I mean, we can get more into it. I don't want to step on Olivia's yeah. moderation toes, but um, there's a lot to talk about. So hi, Katja, how are you? Good. How are you? Hello, Anya. Hello, Katya. <laughs> so, so just before we get started, Anya and I had also curated uh, some exhibitions together in Munich. Had nothing to do with Asia. Yeah, I love being a co-curator. Oh, she... Katja, you froze. Should we hop in to the start the Q&A then? Yeah. OK. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Olivia, and I will be the moderator for this Q&A session for Beyond the Bench. Uh, first, a few housekeeping rules. If you have your microphone on, please remember to turn it off so we can hear the speaker clearly. And secondly, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box. And you can find that by going to, let's see, session at the up top right corner. And underneath that, there will be a Q&A um, tab. You can click and you can type your question there. Um, another way to ask this question is just to type, I have a question, 
and I will call on, call on you and you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question. And if you would like to ask your question yourself, please remember to click the blue button that says share audio and video so that we can hear and see you. And finally, if I accidentally skip your question, just please enter it again into the Q&A box and I will get back to it as soon as possible. So to start us off, I would love to ask Anya a question. You are a well-known jewelry artist and I was wondering how you found your way to curating exhibitions. Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, when, when I came out of uh, alchemy studying, I had a really good friend there, Gabi Feit, who's also, well, of course, jewelry maker. And we wanted to have a, an event at Schmuck. And you all know how difficult it is to get into the official exhibition. So um, since the chances uh, for doing this were small, we decided we would have our own exhibition. And we had one in a, uh, at a bowling um, alley in Munich in a restaurant that was very fun. And since then, I just stayed open for it and especially for co-curating because I think um, doing it with somebody else uh, is just, it's more fun. Yeah. Was it more challenging at the same time? Or like, what was more fun? to co-curate? I think you have uh, two brains involved and uh, each other, I mean, it, it gives more ideas and um, uh, yes, more ideas about artists, more ideas about uh, how to promote, uh, how to write the, the concept and everything. It's just, it's, it's more fun. It's uh, also a chance to learn uh, a lot from somebody else. So, for example, when I uh, co-curated with uh, Katya, um, we had this uh, big uh, one exhibition was the big one between uh, uh, 12 artists from Europe and 12 from the United States. And it is clear for me that Katya knows uh, the artists in the United States much better than than I do. So, yeah, th that was an advantage and everything. It's, it's just more. Yeah, well, also fun in the process of doing it. I, think. I get it. That's how this came together, right? Because we had a group to work collaboratively and people have those ideas that you don't have and you play off each other. And mm -hmm. um, it really, yeah, love it. Uh, I really enjoy the idea of pulling resources and kind of sharing different perspectives. I think there was a research that was talking about scientific papers and um, the teams that had more diversity within their team in terms of just like age, um, gender and uh, race or like different countries, nationalities, they would produce more papers and the papers would be thought of as better quality because you had all those different perspectives coming together. Mm -hmm. And let's see, do we have any questions? Um, Okay, I have a I have another question for Anya. So, why do you think people should care about contemporary jewelry or art jewelry? Um, well, uh, I guess I maybe I uh, talk about. I think because it's a really uh, interesting. Um, uh, how do you call that when two circles uh, uh, an inter intersection an intersection between uh, art and and jewelry uh, because um, well if I talk about uh, jewelry especially in 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 Germany uh, people always think about uh, the pearl necklace and uh, the golden uh, brooch and everything like this and uh, co um, con contemporary jewelry is uh, so more for me it has this uh, has uh, interesting ideas lying behind it uh, and yeah so for me it's just interesting and I think um, very valuable 
So I think it could be that for other people too. <laughs> I don't know. It reminds me of you were talking about Shannon Guo's piece with the stone seal that you can like print your name, like stamp her name with, and how that's part of the ring. And there's like multiple layers of meaning behind it. There's a lot to dig into, I guess, more of a narrative. To uh, this yes. Yes, for example, also uh, this, um, I mean, it could be the door opener in, uh, regarding Chinese uh, jewelry for uh, uh, the whole cultural spectrum of things that we don't know in the, the West. I think that's extremely, uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And speaking yeah. of China, why did you decide to go to China for three years and live in Shanghai? <laughs> oh. Well, actually, um, that wasn't entirely uh, for me to decide because uh, my husband, he, he was bored of uh, Berlin. I, so I came back from Alchemia from Italy and I thought, oh, now I'm, I'm going to enjoy Berlin. And he said, no, he doesn't want to. And then we were searching for uh, another place to go. And yes, I, Shanghai was... Uh, than the intersection between our interests. And going there, did you already speak Chinese or did you learn a language? And if not, what types of obstacles did you run into? Oh my God, that's, uh, no, I, I, well, no, I didn't speak uh, Chinese. I tried to learn it while being uh, there, but, and, and then I, I had this, this idea, I could uh, communicate much better with Chinese artists, of course, if I spoke the language, but I uh, soon realized that this is an, uh, a project that is far bigger than uh, I am and my, the time I can invest. So I just randomly spoke a bit of Chinese and, well, you, you hear my accent in English. I, of course, I had an even worse accent in Chinese and, uh, well, so then you might think you speak Chinese, but nobody understands you. Or the other thing was they understand me and then they reply and they're so fast <laughs> that I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, that was really... Uh, yeah, that was an, uh, a big challenge. Also because if people speak uh, English, I mean, it's uh, for me, it's not my mother language for the Chinese, it's not their mother language. So we, and there's this, again, this uh, whole cultural background uh, um, behind it. So we might use the same words, but it doesn't have the same meaning. And you just find out uh, afterwards, so. This um, interestingly enough connects back to Wan He's talk about sort of body language and like gestures that we kind of unconsciously do to communicate and her interest mm. in that. So in China, you were writing for Art Jewelry Forum and you were also curating uh, different exhibitions. Is there anything else that you also did in China? Anything else that what? That you um, did in China? Anything other, any other projects? Oh, yes. Well, yes. just uh, trying to understand uh, the culture and what people are doing and uh, going with my bicycle to Shanghai and looking at things, taking photos and yeah, making my jewelry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went first rented a band you can't, you can't and uh, afterwards had my own band at home. So speaking about sort of like soaking in the culture and like that taking a lot of time and resources and just like space in your mind to learn about all those things. Yes, yes. Um, you talked about Edward T. Hall's idea of this like cultural iceberg the little tip on the top and then like more on the bottom below the waterline. Can you talk about some aspects of German, German culture um, above and below the waterline? Like what do you think is above the waterline and the iceberg and what's below? Um, 
Well, I mean, since I also lived uh, for some time in the United States, I, I have some examples. So, for example, um, what lies below uh, the waterline. If you go to a party in uh, Germany, it might be very well uh, that if you don't know anybody, you it's really hard to come to know people because uh, they will stick together in a group and stay in the group. So that's kind of uh, uh, difficult. Uh, well, in in contrast, in the United States, you I, I never experienced being on my own at a party. Um, then and then I um, I noticed uh, that a, a German uh, German people then being at this party will go away home from this party and think, oh, I made friends because in Germany that would mean. If you're talking uh, um, for an evening in a really nice manner and it's interesting, you might be a friend. But uh, well, in the United States, it's you're not necessarily a friend, of course, after a party or not a friend. And it takes just as long as in Germany to make friends. But it's a very uh, a different way of people interacting if you don't know each uh, other. I don't know if I could get that uh, through. Yeah, and, you do. Uh, That's very interesting. Yeah. And of course, uh, especially in China, I learned about myself uh, that I'm, 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 I'm really uh, germ because we had this other thing I, I wanted to study. I, I mean, I did study Chinese at a university and I told my uh, teachers, you know, I don't have much time. I, I can't uh, learn writing the characters because also I can write with a computer using pinyin and this stuff. And I thought that's totally OK. They will understand me. I mean, I'm not here for studying chi Chinese. I, I'm a jewelry artist. And then I noticed that they are really upset with me. And I asked my Chinese teacher and friend, why? Why are they so uh, upset with me? And they, she said, oh, my God, you're so German. And she started laughing. And I was, what? Why? Why am I German? And she said, you would never say uh, no to your teacher. You don't do that, you know? Uh, and I, yeah, but then I, if I say yes, I have to do it. And she, no, you say, I will do what I uh, can do. I will do my best. And then you don't do it if you don't have the time to do it. So another example, what is uh, above the iceberg, below the iceberg yeah. and yeah. yeah. And uh, Katya, you had a question. Do you want to ask it yourself? Or? Okay. Um, yeah, I I um, I don't actually know this about you, Tanya, <laughs> but I was wondering if um, the jewelry that you made that was was your experience in China did that in any way influence the kind of work that you made afterwards in some way or other and and you know it's I mean the the I I often think about this more in the in the kind of broader cultural context where uh you know we're in this globalized world but we're always you know when we're exposed so intensely to a different culture there's there's some part of it that may uh kind of make their way into uh you know, maybe the way we approach work or uh, or even, I don't know, a certain, I don't know, a, a certain material or certain expression. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, since I uh, work a lot with everyday materials, I found uh, the quail egg. I mean, I have this uh, brooch. It is a quail egg. And I um, this was what I uh, um, found. Uh, I mean, in China, people eat so many uh, quail eggs, so it was um, 
uh, you could could find this thing in every supermarket and I walked by and I thought my god this quail egg it has um, the ideal shape for a piece of jewelry it is light and and I just want to do something with it and from there came this uh, the a whole body of uh, work um, called femme fragile about um, the um, maybe fragile seeming woman that is I mean like an Asian woman for example that is really like uh, uh, thin framed and looks fragile but I mean uh, Asian women at least in, in Shanghai and I think all over the world they are really in Shanghai they are really tough business uh, uh, women I have never seen uh, so strong people like these women and this was um yeah the starting point for this whole body of work um yes and also the work i do now with an uh little, little uh pumpkin um uh, a gourd bottleneck gourd or gourd it's called that also comes from china so i was very influenced uh by china And Stacy, uh, Stacy has a question about. Would you, would you like to ask me something? Sure. Um, I was just wondering about, like, you know, um, there's a where you're moving away from when you're creating an exhibition. You're moving away from just like throwing stuff on a pedestal, and you know, the display is so important now too to an exhibition. How do you go about like this culture effect? the way exhibition displays are created? How do you go up with the artwork or the theme affect the way you design the displays in the space for the exhibition? Um, okay, I, I have to, uh, uh, well, the, the theme of the exhibition, uh, uh, in, you, you mean in China or uh, in general? In general in general i mean the theme is always uh, um um uh, found with my co-curator so we that is one one of the parts where it is so uh, interesting to exchange ideas about what could be interesting and then to um yeah to get new ideas and uh the the space um is how well the first uh, two exhibitions I curated were on a bowling alley and how did we get there I uh, I, I I don't know uh, I think we were, went to this restaurant and saw the bowling alley and was really like excited about it and thought well if you create a bo uh, an exhibition at a bowling alley um, nobody has seen it and we need something for schmuck in Mun munich to be really uh, an an eye catcher i mean that was uh, what i i forgot her name what she said before in her uh, uh, talk about new york jewelry week you really need a place where people are coming uh, by because it's on their way that they take every city every uh, jewelry exhibition has a course so you need to be there and then you need on top you need something else to attract um, attention so that was for the first two exhibitions the other two were there was an exhibition space which was very convenient and a nice one on top uh, this is how this was uh, found and with Katya well we knew this exhibition space from uh, uh, somebody else before so um, I think it's always um, a kind of a mixture how you find things and then you have the space and then you think about how could we uh, exhibit there so in a bowling alley for example uh, we exhibited at, at the walls and on the furniture and yes so it's, I, I i don't think that i have a rule for how i go about it i'm sorry 
the, the rule is you want to have fun with it, right? Like it's got to be, you want to, you want to, you like that challenge of doing something different and pushing that creative aspect. Yeah, but uh, maybe also Katya, you uh, could uh, say something about uh, our exhibitions. Are you interested? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, not not to kind of steal Anya's thunder. No, no, but, no, no. Um, no, I would say there's there's first of all, I think there's a, a whole bunch of constraints, uh, and you know when you when you don't live in a place where you're trying to put up an exhibition, right? That puts mm -hmm. kind of a little, uh, um, you know. Uh, a damper on what you can do. It also, I think, uh, it depends a little bit on how much, um, you know, do you have any funding for any kind of exhibition furniture, right? And, and exhibition furniture of any kind, if you don't, if you're not local to the place, you're mm -hmm. kind of constricted to what you can uh, conjure up out of thin air. So I think there's, a, there's always this, like, what can we achieve within certain constraints? But then we, you know, our two exhibitions, I would also say, were quite uh, different in nature, and um, and but it's always, I would say, the display has, is always directed uh, by the, the the like Anya was saying by the theme of the exhibition, what you're trying to highlight and what where you where, where you're trying to point people to, uh, and uh, you know, I I think it's always uh, you want to make sure that the the whatever you're using does not take over the work. Hmm. And uh, we did have a question from Elizabeth. I think we should ask what took you in the Q and A also. Yeah, she asked what um, took you to China initially, and I think Anya answered that question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but. Somebody is talking in the background. It's really hard to understand. Could you repeat, please? You want me to read? I can read it. Ah, OK. OK, so Elizabeth wrote, um, what took you to China initially? Was it to learn about Chinese jewelry, or or was that just a happy result? And if you, miss, if you talked about it, she missed it. And then she also asked, um, oh, no, this was a comment about thinking about security and things. I think you did you did touch on that earlier. Yeah, well, coincidence took me uh, to China. But it, uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing uh, adventure. So coincidence is great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading them in the wrong order. The newest ones are on top. So it says she answered that thanks. How is it to be back in Berlin? Are you as engaged with jewelry as you were in China? Um, Yes, I am, and then I'm also uh, engaged with uh, art and the art scene in Berlin. But uh, well, to answer this question, when I was first back in Berlin, it, it was a shock because I, I thought I, I moved back to a village from Shanghai to Berlin. I thought I, I'm back in a village. There. Shanghai is so high energy, and um, Berlin, in comparison, is very slow nice but slow yes and i'm still i'm uh um, doing jewelry and and art mm -hmm. and we also have a, uh, questions from andrew in the chat um as a maker how was it to create in another place did you make a lot of work when you were away or was it more of an idea gathering process until you were back in your studio Ah, uh, yeah, that that was a big question that I um, and I did some research before I um, went to China and I found um, a, a jewelry school that um, prepares Chinese <clears throat> students to go to study in uh, the UK in the um, afterwards. And there I rented a bench. And from there, there were some people uh, that um, I could get to know and they helped me to find my way around in Shanghai and from there, yes, um, uh, exactly. So I worked there. I first rented a bench and then bought my own um, um, 
workbench and tools and opened a studio in our apartment. And Sharon, I think you had a question as well. And then I think the other presentation is going to start in a few minutes. Um, am I wrong? At, oh, no, we, there's time because there's a break. So 430. So continue on. It's, you know, it brings up, uh, I think, a big question that I, I see and have seen at a lot of exhibitions. And it's in a way similar uh, how I see how people photograph their their jewelry. It's a similar issue because on the one hand you want to show it in a sort of unusual way, but it might the whole environment might just take over. Um, and that is, you know, how do you you want to be creative, but in the end, it's really not about the installation. It's really about the work and and how do you manage that? Is uh, I think every time is a uh, and, and it's also culturally defined. I remember, you know, like I'm from Holland original, originally way back minimalism. You know, and when I moved to the United States uh, and I started showing at Sofa. Um, I would say less is more. And people would say, oh, you don't understand. We're in America. Less is not enough. And more is not enough. So it's culturally, you know, here in the United States, people want to see a lot. When I look at images, for instance, of exhibitions in Korea, very minimal, very minimal in general. And uh, yeah, maybe I'm old-fashioned, uh, but it, it brings up every time a very interesting aspect, I think. Uh, you want to do something creative and maybe innovative, but do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, you you're getting it. You're a little choppy. Um, but I think we can hear you. I don't know if anybody wants to respond or do you, did anybody know? Well, I, I, I also th uh, have thought about that a lot. And I, uh, I do find that uh, a, uh, a display can elevate the work that is maybe beyond something minimal. Uh, if it's done in a smart way and that really honors what the work is all about. And I think it may be slightly different uh, depending also on the exhibition, the theme and how much work is actually being shown and the diversity of the work. Uh, the more diverse the work, the I think uh, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but I, I, um, I think an, a, a smart, uh, interesting exhibition display can be uh, also really helpful, but I do I do understand that we've all seen exhibitions where <laughs> we might go, well, where's the jewelry? <laughs> or what about yeah. the jewelry? Mm -hmm. well, the same as, as I mentioned, you know, when when I get certain, or you know, you can see it in in magazines, but also images that I get from artists, and they use a model, and the model is so unbelievably dominant, you know, with lots of make lots of body showing and, and lots of makeup and, and the jewelry just disappears. And, and I ask myself, like, what, what is this image really about? So. I think it's also uh, jewel, showing jewelry on models. It's, uh, it's also really uh, interesting and to my mind in the fashion uh, uh, right. In the way that that it's done in the fashion, often the, the jewelry is a little bit. I always think that when like the Met Gala and it's all about the fashion, and then there's a little oh look at this little blingy thing, right. and it's um, but it's really it's hard to really kind of make that a showpiece, and it's partly related to the fact that jewelry is so kind of right. personal and and maybe a little less it's, showy. Sort of more like fashion jewelry, which I understand is a different category, but often, yes, you're right. But 
client yesterday, and this is nothing new. And she says, and she buys clothes, and she says, since I've known her for I don't know, quite a number of years, and she, she said to me yesterday, I buy clothes now, but I look at them and say, Oh, we lost him. Saron, we lost you. I don't know if you're even here hearing us. Um, there is one question in the Q and A. Um, it says you talked about Alexander Thomas's idea of people being task oriented and relationship oriented. So, which one are you, and why do you think that is? Um, well, I'm. I found out <clears throat> the latest so while being in China that I'm task related. I'm a uh, um, typical germ in this <laughs> uh, regard, I guess. Yes, that's uh, yeah. This is how it works here. <laughs> You're breaking. We we lost you before, Sharon. I I don't think we can hear you now. Maybe try to reload um, the page. It's not good. <laughs> For the, this is one of the reasons that we pre-recorded all the the presentations, right? Mm -hmm. That and the time. What time is it where you are on? It's like ten. Uh, yes, a quarter past ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I thought it was a really smart idea to uh, record the presentations because otherwise, yeah, you always have problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I could, uh, I taped it so many times, you know. The ones I thought I'm awful, I just erased. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It takes the pressure off. Yes. Anybody else have Actually, questions? Actually, um, can I, yeah. I have another question. We sort of touched on that a little bit in the previous session panel. Um, uh, and I know, Anya, that you've been uh, also interested and involved a little bit, and it's a shame that Sharon just dropped out again. But um, we had talked about um, this uh, kind of cultural uh, exchange in terms of students visiting, uh, and you said uh, that where you rented your bench, that was uh, a school that kind of prepared students to go uh, and study in the UK, and uh, I don't know, the US maybe as well. And I, I wonder, uh, you know, we had sort of touched on at the end there a little bit. Uh, there's there's such a kind of influx in in the direction of the of the West, which of course had for so long kind of dominated the field. But I wonder uh, if, in your experience, is is there like somewhat of an you know like an opposite um, movement uh, that you know maybe students from the West might be interested to. Uh, join programs in, uh, and I'm just going to ask China because that's what you might know about. Um, I think for studying jewelry, there is uh, less interest. I know that there was a plan for having an exchange between Hangzhou and uh, Pforzheim, I think, or was it Ida Oberstein? I, I don't remember uh, correctly. It might have been Ida Oberstein. I don't know if this came through. Uh, so about studying, uh, I don't think so. But probably somebody like Bife might uh, much better um, in uh, answering that question. Uh, but people come to China because of art residencies. Yes. And in other fields like ceramics, of course, a lot of people from uh, Western countries come to China because it's so um, uh, well known for all uh, ceramic things. It's just like art jewelry. Um, 
it, it started in China like uh, only uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So it's, this is, it, it doesn't have a tradition as art jewelry, other kinds of jewelry, of course. Um, yes. And then uh, we have to take probably into account that uh, for a long time uh, when um, uh, there was uh, the, um, how do you call it, Maoist uh, culture, I mean, uh, art, uh, jewelry wasn't something you could wear and jewelry wasn't something that uh, was uh, wanted. It, it was totally erased. So I think all these are points why probably for art jewelry, I, I don't know, I don't think many people come to China at this point, but this might change soon. <laughs>